Hi, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvellously well. On this fine uh, morning here in Laurel Canyon, I'm going to be talking to you about how I mix in a hybrid way. So what I do is I mix in the box and I actually mix through a console. Now, sometimes I'll mix entirely in a box if I'm doing like a real slamming kind of uh, rock or dance track or something like that. But with this particular artist, um, I'm mixing live drums and live stuff in the box and breaking out through the console. So we're going to we're going to talk about the whole process. So this might be a little bit of a long video. Anyway, as ever, please subscribe. Um, go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list. And you know what? I'll give you this session to mix. Um, so we're going to upload that in the next few days. So you can check back. So go to the email list, sign up there, and you'll get a whole bunch of other free stuff. You'll also get um, access to our Vimeo account where there is... Uh, an expanded view on recording drums, um, expanded view on recording pianos. There's also um, the, se the drum session that I use in the Beat Detective tutorial where you can um, use the same drums I use and you can also practice editing on those. Um, there's some free tracks that I've recorded that you can hear and also um, all my drum samples. You can get my drum samples as well, the ones that I've used on pretty much everybody from The Fray to Aerosmith and everything in between. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have a look at this song. Now, this song is uh, by the artist Chase. Um, and we've used him quite a lot of times to go through stuff because he's very eclectic. And we've done stuff with live drums and we've done stuff with, um, with uh, program stuff. Now, this is live drums recorded here with um, some samples added to it. So let's start with the drums. Now, if I take it out of group a second, here's the live kick. Um, I'll solo it for you. Cool, so that's the live kick. And I've added using addictive drums. And the way I do addictive, and we can do a whole tutorial on this, but the way I do addictive is I use Melodyne to, co to capture the MIDI information. And that gives me all of the velocity, all of the volume of every single hit. So it's not just a case of putting a sample in against it, um, which I do do on times anyway, but it's not just a case of putting a sample in against it, but putting a sample, as you can see here, there's different velocities, there's different volumes of the hits. See, these first two are pretty consistent, and then this third one comes down a little bit on this, and it just gives it a little bit more, you know, breadth, uh, breathes more, and basically sounds more natural. So. Here is one which is the bootstraps kick. You see it's not just a machine gun playing the same da 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 every time. And then the one above is a, more of a metallic kick. Which I'm using to give you the click, the sort of the beta hitting the head. EQ wise on this first one, I've got a little 5k boost. Cutting a little 400, which is like kind of a thickness I don't need. Um, I'm also using SBL Transient Designer to increase the attack here. Leaving the sustained standard, so I'm not affecting it. But you see, I'm adding a little bit more attack on it. So it's exaggerating the, the hit of the beta. The, you know, the beta hitting the head. The second one, the bootstraps one here, the EQ, is um, same thing. A little 5K boost, 400 um, cut, so similar kind of thing. And again, the transient designer, again, is boosting a little bit of the attack. So let's put those three together. Sounds pretty natural, but it's consistent. Now, if you zoom in on here, you'll see that the polarity, the phase, is the same. See here? All of these are in phase of each other. I mean, with the live kick, it's slightly out. I mean, you can see the front and back. If I make this a little bigger. The front and back is around here is pretty consistent. But it's never going to be perfect. But these two are pretty consistent with each other. You know, and you can mess with the phase. You can, you can put time adjuster on there and shift it backwards and forwards and play with it until it sounds the way you want it to sound. Okay, so these three kicks are being summed, being bussed through the kick master here. And this Kickmaster has um, a little 300 cut here and a little 7K lift here, just to kind of like, you can give it a little bit. 
little tiny little extra aggression on the kick. And then I have an API after it, which has got some 50 boost, um, a little 5K boost, a little 10K. So again, it's giving it a little bit more top end and a little bit more bottom this time. I'm also using a room because my drum room isn't that big. So I'm just using a, a good old fashioned DigiDesign, you know, before Avid Dverb. Here it is. You know, this comes as standard with your Pro Tools when you buy it. And that's being summed through the console. Cool. So this is what I'm doing in a hybrid world where I'm mixing in the box and also coming out on the console here. So here, you can see on the SSL, um, I've got, let's look at the EQ of the first here. There's an AK boost, giving it a little extra click. You could do this obviously in Pro Tools, you could add, you could add this SSL strip if you have it. Um, and um, AK boost, I do sometimes often. Here's a 2.5 boost, two 2.5 boosts, which I actually prefer than the super highs. It's more natural sounding for me. And here is a 3, 350 cut and about 60. I'm boosting nearly 9 dBs to give me that real thickness. It is actually peaking slightly on here. I could bring it down a little bit. The transient's so fast, I don't actually, it doesn't kill me that much. A little bit of compression. I got 3 dBs worth of compression. I got a ratio of 3 to 1. And you see the expander coming in. Let's take this off. adding a tiny little bit of flag to it. That's pretty natural, and a little bit more flag. EQ out. A little woolly, a little too much low mid for me. A little bit more definition. So you could copy these kind of EQ settings on an SSL plugin and use that on your master bus for your kick. So next, let's move on to our snare top. Here's the snare. Snare bottom. And all this uh, time adjuster plugin is doing is just moving it back. That's actually moving it back so it's in time with the overheads. So what this is doing is it's coming back here. The overhead underneath. It's a little easier to see. Make it larger. Okay, so once again, so here you can see it's moved back in time. You see the first, uh, the first transient here. If I move it back, yeah, it says about 138 here. We can average it out. We could go to the back of this one here, 143. And basically what it's doing is it's nudging the snare top and snare bottom back enough in phase with the overheads. And I, I like that sound. I like my snare drum to be in phase with my overheads. My overheads are measured exactly to the snare. If you watch one of my drum videos, you'll see how I measured it to the snare. And the reason for that is, is it just makes the kit feel whole if the drums are all in phase. Okay, so no EQ going on in that in particular, but it is going through a snare master. Get this out of the way again. Um, so there's a master here. And on this, there is a little... Uh, RE, um, a little Renaissance com compression, wave compressor. It's quite a decent amount. But the release is set super fast. And then afterwards, um, a little EQ, 7K lift, and a little cut of the low lows just to take out some of that kick bleed in there. Okay, now what else we have on this is again addictive, doing the same thing, using Melodyne to correct to, uh, to create MIDI information. Um, as you can see, you see what it's done there with the snare. I've created this. Cool, and you see, I mean, it's, it's nice, it's sort of a, it's quite natural. No little natural roll there. Also, what I've done is with the same thing, I've used, I've created like the grace notes. So we zoom in a little bit. 
because you'll hear in the way that the drums were played like that, these little tiny grace notes coming up here. And I'm using a couple of things. You'll notice the time adjuster is also applied to these snares, so they're again in phase with the overheads. Because the snare, this snare is created off of the live snare. It's just triggered off the live snare, so it has to also go back in phase with the overheads. Hence again, time adjuster. Now the MV2 here, I like this. This is a really, really smart plugin. And what it does is it, 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 it basically simulates, in my ears, to my ears at least, uh, parallel compression because it allows like the bottom to always be present. You know, the quieter notes come up and it squashes down the top. So it's sort of compressing on both ways. It really is like parallel compressing something. So together. You'll notice that my kick samples and my snare samples are actually coming through a pair of channels on my console which have no EQ and compression on them. They are, these are specifically chosen, they're the sounds I want to use, and I'm not compressing or EQing them anymore. I'm just compressing and EQing the actual live stuff. Okay, so let's go and check out the kick. I'm oh, sorry, the snare, now that we've looked at the bus. Cool, so back on the channel here for the SSL. This is uh, EQ engaged, compression, etc. engaged here. Now, I've got a little 100 there that I'm boosting just to give it some low weight to the snare. Um, I'm boosting, again, a little bit of lows at about 220, 250, 220. That's very traditional for me. That's like a classic kind of ACDC low boost. Um, you know, the sort of tubby, highway to hell, back in black snare. It would be that kind of area there. Because they were using Neve EQs, which had a 220 boost. Okay, um, also about 5 to 6K here. And again, a little extra boost on that area there. And um, just to really kind of brighten up the top for this particular snare. I'm also coming up to just over 70 and cutting the lows. So um, there's a lot of boost going on in the low, low mids and the lows here. But then I'm cutting up to it. So it's pretty tight. Again, the odd transients peeking out here, doesn't bother me. I've worked with Chris, Crystal Algae, and his red lights are going all over the console. Um, anyway, so, see the amount of compression here? EQ off. EQ in. Just gives it a little bite, a little more presence. Again, a little spank from the little spank there. You heard the reverb come up there because we're into the chorus so we're pushing the reverb. Cool. So that's basically our, uh, that's our setup there on the snare. Oh one thing to mention here is the reverb. Um, the reverb I've got going here, I've got a gate because I'm coming off all the snares so there's obviously a little bleed from the, uh, from the, uh, from the live snare so it's slightly gated. You can see The reverb is an R verb, it's a great reverb. And again, the MV2, just to even out the verb. You'll see here what happened when we were listening. It goes first, and in comes the chorus, and the verb will go up. Cool. Okay, so next are the toms. Now, what I do with the toms, or trick I do, is I actually turn down or gain down the, the stuff in between. You'll see, here's a rack. If I go back to take 36. See the process there? See, there's the tom, and there's the, it's gain down between. Everybody does different ways, but look, there's the natural tom, the rack, and you'll, you can hear the bleed. You hear all the bleed going on. Now let's go back to the final one. I mean, that's completely out. Sometimes I won't go that much out. It really depends on the sound I'm going for. Sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of the ambience of the toms. But yeah, so that's what I did. It's like it's gained in between, and then so it just exaggerates the toms. Okay, so we'll look at the rack first things we're here. Again, time adjuster, knocking it back in phase with the overheads. So you see. 
where the overheads are and it's just coming back in phase just enough so the overheads are all together that's a trick I do every time an REQ I'm rolling off 78 and below actually using a limiter on this this time just to kind of get some volume on it but again it's like it's not there's no rules I just like using the uh, you know on this particular instance I put a limiter on it seemed to push it harder into the console but I wouldn't always do that sometimes I'd lightly compress it sometimes I wouldn't need to do anything um, there's also this I love this yeah, I've been using it for years I'm sure there's other ones around but I like this the Renaissance bass it just gives me a little bottom end you know if I you hear it without it's okay but you see you hear that kind of extra ring that it gives just an extra um really helps the tom Okay, so the same thing. I do the same thing on both the uh, rack and the floor. Here's the floor. Again, time adjusters to knock it in phase of the overheads. REQ, limiter again, and R base. And he only does one tom hit. On the floor hit, sorry. There it is. Okay. Um, let's go to the console. A quick look at the toms. What I do is I separate them out. I've panned these quite wide apart for this. Sometimes I'll have the rack a little bit more at like 20% or something like that. But here, you know, it's nice to have them wider, but it's really up to you on this. You know, to get it in phase with the overheads, sometimes they'll, I'll, I'll go a lot narrower. It's usually 20 to 30% on the rack and 60% or so on the floor. Okay, so let's check out the EQ settings. Um, little one on a little sort of 100 or so on both of these, a uh, little boost. Again, a lot of cut at about three, three fifty to get rid of that kind of ooh, that that low mid in the toms that just doesn't sound good. Some boost at like four and a half k, just for a little stick action. A little bit more boost at six k, and then here I'm rolling off um, everything below seventy or so, so that there's no like when boosting all this bass, but I don't want it to affect the bass or the kick, you know. And again, compression. See just a tiny amount of compression there. Again, just that little, e, that little SSL EQ and SSL thwack that the compressor gives you. Okay, so, and just lastly on this, Tom Verb, again, little, uh, a little gate in there, just so it's getting the main hit of it. And once again, just good old fashioned D-Verb. Cheap, cheerful, does the job. Okay, moving on to the overhead. So here's the overhead track. It looks like there's a time adjuster on it. Um, probably just to nudge the left hand one slightly back to the right. It looks like the phase wasn't perfect. So yeah, it's 25 sample samples on the left just to bring it back. So the overheads are perfectly in phase of each other. Okay, so here's the overheads. Pretty accurate representation of the drum kit. Sounds good. Check out the overheads on the console. Here's the EQ. Now, it sounds nice without the EQ in. It sounds natural, but it's giving us a little bit too much bottom end. It's going to muddy up. So, EQ in. You'll see it's cut quite high up to 120 here. So it's high passed at 120. The top's completely open, no cut there. There's a little boost to like 9K, 10K, just to give it some air on the cymbals. Another little boost at about 5 or 6K, again for the cymbals. A lot of cut in the 350, I don't like that in drums. And a tiny, no, no boost on the 100. So it's snappy, nice small amount of compression on those snare hits, just for a little pat. So it's kind of woolly sounding, it's, it's fine, but here we go. Nice and snappy, woolly sounding, snappy. There you go. So you can copy those kind of settings on your SSL plugin if you have it. Also here, just so, just so you know, these are linked. So when I put this side in, these two channels are linked to each other. Okay, last but no means least, we have the hi-hat. Pretty straightforward, no EQ. Um, I just used a Lewitt mic on it that doesn't really have a huge amount of bottom end, one of those pencil condensers, and was perfect for the job. 
Again, you'll notice I'm using a um, time adjuster to not get in phase with the overheads. And that is basically how, that's the combination to create our drums. Now, the other thing I'm also doing, um, there's an overhead master here, which just controls the volume going in. Nothing special about it. I'm also creating a fake room, just to because we're not using room mics in particular, because we're in a smaller room. And again, that's an R verb. Um, it's a short size. It's a biggish room, but short reverberation. It's only 0.65 of a second. And again, the MV2, it's a great plugin using that to just kind of keep the keep the verb nice and even sounding. So let's uh, let's solo the drums on the console and have a listen. By the way, the hi-hat is fed down through the overheads as well. I don't have a specific channel on the console, which is only the overhead. So I'm just soloing the drums on the console. It's pretty natural. If you look here, 25 and 26 is where my samples are coming out. Grace notes, kick and snare all together. If we go to 35, 36, that's where the verbs are coming out. You'll notice on both of these channels, no EQ, no compression. If I wanted to change, the reason why I'm doing this is because th these verbs are automated and the samples I'm automating as well, you know, for a bit more aggression in certain areas. Therefore, if you're compressing on a console and EQing on a console, that's fine. But if you suddenly do volume rides, like dramatic volume rides, it might not get louder. All that might happen is it compresses more. So I leave these open. If I want to do compression on an EQ on my samples or my verbs and stuff like that, I do them in the box. And then I just send them to the console and use them as volume rides. I do use the console for automation from time to time, but ultimately you can do a lot of automation in Pro Tools very quickly and very easily, but you have to be aware if you're going to do automation moves on in Pro Tools and then have them come through a console which you, where you have dynamics, you have compression and EQ, sometimes just turning up the vocal, all it's going to do is compress it more. So the vocal gets louder, it compresses more. The samples get louder, they compress more. It may not actually sound like they're coming up in volume. It might do the opposite, especially with a vocal. It might start sounding choked and in, in the track, it might actually feel like it's getting quieter. So I am careful to make sure that I have you know, stereo channels on my console that are available where I can keep it open sounding. Okay, so next is uh, the bass that I played. It's just a DI, a DI only. I just plugged in, I can't remember if it was the PV or... And you know, it's it, it's not a super high end -y bass tone because we're sort of in the reggae world. We're not going for full blown reggae, but you know, I was playing that kind of groove. So the DI printed, um, it's not particularly compressed on the way in, you can tell. Um, you know, still some dynamics in there. Um, and then I have a master here where I have a little EQ boost at 100, 110, some of that lows. 65, nice gentle high pass at 65, not really aggressive. So it's not going straight down here. So it's just rolling off. And the reason why I do that is like, I want, that's where my kick lives. So I don't want there to be like too much bass in that area because it will just muddy up the kick and there won't be any definition, any thump from the kick. Okay, secondly, I have a C4. And you've seen that in some of my other videos that I like to do this because it's compressing everything from 250 and below evenly. And by doing that, once you compress everything at 250, so it's always there and apparent, you can then turn it up. And it gives you a nice low, low mids to low lows kind of evenness in the town. Um, next, I just threw another REQ on. It's probably spe specifically for this tone. I did put a little extra top end boost. Again, another roll off just to, you know, another high pass just to kind of tighten up the sound there. Um, after that, an API, another 100 boost. I just like the way the API EQs sound. They sound good. I have other external API EQs as well, you know, hardware ones. And there's an 800 boost. The 800 gives you a little bit of that piano -iness. That's out. Da, da, da. Puts a little bit of that back in. And then again, here's our old friend, our bass. Eddie Hertz.
just a little bit of boost on the on the lows. Again, I'm using a limiter here to even it out because I wanted this bass tone to be just consistent all the time. Recently, this is a session from a few months ago. Recently, I've been using the MV2 on the bass. I love that. So I highly suggest that. Um, and then another eight, another 50 boost here. And that came while I was mixing at the end with the kick. I just wanted to kind of just, you know, when you're boosting and cutting around the same areas, it can give you a nice tight ridge. So even though I've been cutting 65 and 53 lightly, this is just kind of giving us a nice ridge there. So it's nice and tight in those lows. And again, I like the sound of API EQs. So that's there. Okay, let's go and check it out on the console. So here's our EQ, our compression. EQ in. A little bit of definition, a little bit more 800. A little 350. You notice I've been cutting 350 out of all the drums. Now I'm putting it into the bass. So there's a nice little hole in the drums for the bass to sit in. Um, I've got a little 3K boost there. And then I'm coming down, tightening up the bottom end a little bit. That's probably about 50, 40 or 50 hertz. High passing, and then I'm high passing at about 8K, so there's no top end getting in the way of other stuff. Compression. Again, the same SSL thwack. Keeps every note a lot more even. And again, the occasional peak on the overload. I don't care. Sounds good, that's all that matters to me. If you come over here, you'll see just a master bus compressor. So I'll have my attack and my release set. Use the auto first on the release. Ratio is only four to one. There you go.